if I were to ask you this morning, what are your thoughts on love stories? My guess is, even from an immediate reaction, there's a variety of opinions. Some of you, maybe preferably many of you ladies, love a good love story. Maybe you love to watch it on Hallmark as Christmas season's coming up, or read the novels, or maybe you're one who just hates it. Or maybe you're one who's indifferent to it. Well, this morning, we're going to all dive in to the beginning of a great love story. Like it or not, we're diving into a great love story. But it's not any ordinary love story. It's a love story in which God's sovereignty is put on full display. Hence the title, The Sovereignty of God in Trials. God's sovereignty is put on full display in the story of Ruth this morning. If you have a Bible, I want to invite you uh, to go ahead and turn to page 262 in the Pew Bible there. Or uh, if you've got your own Bible and unfamiliar, uh, Ruth sits there between Judges and Samuel there in the Old Testament. It's one of the earlier books after the law, the first five books there of the Bible. As you're turning there, we're going to be studying this very short book over the next four weeks. Ruth is nearly 85 verses long. There's some several psalms that are superior in numbers and length to this short little book. And yet, it is important for us here, even in 2023, to unfold such a book. Because we, again, we see God's sovereignty. We see not only a love story, a love story which puts God's love and kindness in the midst of everything on display. It is a love story that leads to our ultimate salvation. I'm going to try and not get ahead of myself, but leave little clues along the way as we study through Ruth if you don't know the ending. It's remarkable. God is put on display in this love story of Ruth. Ruth has a unique beginning and setting, though. If you'll look there at Ruth 1.1, here, in the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a man of Bethlehem in Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. Right here in the introduction, we find Ruth set in the days of the judges. This is significant, because the, the point of Ruth is that here a Moabite woman stands in contrast to a nation who was called by God to be his people, and yet they were doing what was right in their own eyes. The days of the judges were where people did what was right in their own eyes. They thought themselves as kings, as their own kings, because there was not a king to lead the people. Everyone pursued what their hearts desired. Israel, over and over again in this time period, would go and do what was right in their own eyes. God would judge them accordingly. Through these judges, typically, the people would cry out, Lord, we repent, we repent. They would come back for a short time to only go and do worse. The days of the judges and when our stories like Samson appears. Samson may be your hero in the Bible. He's not that big of a hero. Samson was a fool who God used. This is the day that Ruth is set in. A foreigner sets in contrast of this. And that's where we dive into here now in Ruth, beginning in chapter 1. So hear the word of the Lord from Ruth. Actually, let me back up because I almost got ahead of my own self. I want to draw out a contrast here. Ruth, in our English Bibles, as I have already said, sits between Samuel and Judges. Pointing here is a woman between the days of the Judges and the coming king. It's not the way in the Hebrew Bible. This shows significance in our English Bibles, but there's something more significant in the way the Hebrew is structured. The book of Proverbs sits before Ruth in the Hebrew Bible on the hills of Proverbs 31. Ruth is the proverbial 31 woman, a woman who fears God, who is to be desired, a Moabite woman. 
This foreign woman is the proverbial 31 woman. Keep that in mind as we study through this book. Now, hear the word of the Lord from Ruth chapter 1, beginning in verse 2. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. And a man of Bethlehem in Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab. He and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Mahalon and Chilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem in Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives, the name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other Ruth. They lived there about ten years, and both Mahalon and Chilion died, so that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law to return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the fields of Moab that the Lord had visited his people and given them food. So she set out from the place where she was with her two daughters-in-law, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each of you to her mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you, as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest, each of you in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. And they said to her, No, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb that they may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, even if I should have a husband this night and should bear sons, would you wait, therefore, or would you therefore wait till they were grown? Would you therefore remain for marrying? No, my daughters, for it is exceedingly bitter to me for your sake that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Then they lifted up their voices and left again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. And she said, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there will I be buried. May the Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts me from you. And when Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more. So the two of them went on until they came to Bethlehem. And when they came to Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the woman said, Is this Naomi? She said to them, Do not call me Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went away full, and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi, when the Lord has testified against me, and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, with her, who returned from the country of Moab. And they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of barley harvest. Now, Ruth is titled Ruth. But let me let you in on a secret. The main character is actually not Ruth. God's kindness is shown through Ruth. It is shown through another. But much of the story is his main focus is on the heart and struggle and family of Naomi. Notice again how Ruth 1 opens. It, it centers on Naomi and her family and her husband and two sons. We'll see this as we wrestle with Ruth here this morning. But let me get to what I think is the main idea here of Ruth chapter 1. And it is this. And it's here on the screen. God is sovereign over all things, including our sorrows. Even then, he is doing more than we can see and is deserving of our trust. Let me repeat that. God is sovereign over all things, including our sorrows. Even then, he is doing more than we can see and is deserving of our trust. We're going to look at this in three points here. 
Point number one, many sorrows. Point number two, bitter weeping. And point number three, timely return. Many sorrows, bitter weeping, and timely return. Let's look at point number one, many sorrows. Again, we start here back in Ruth 1, 1 through 5, in the story where judges ruled a famine in the land, a man of Bethlehem in Judea went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The backdrop again is it's in the days of the judges. Famine has come upon the land. Now, many of us have no understanding of what famine is. Because even in our hardest moments, it's not been a result of famine. Yes, I know I'm not ignorant of the Great Depression, of when poverty was at an all-time high. But it wasn't because famine was flooding the land. It wasn't because there was unability for crops to be raised and planted and grown up. It was lack of labor. It was a lack of circumstances. But famine we have not known in our nation's history. In fact, even where many of us come from may have bits and pieces of famine, but many of us don't know the famines of the Middle East. Famines that would be so severe without provision. They would plant at nothing because of drought. Rains would be withheld. Again, this is in the days of the judges. God's judgment coming upon them. Famine coming upon the land. No food. No provision. And here's this one family of Judah. That of Elimelech. And his sons. They're from Bethlehem. They go. They sojourn. They go to try and find refuge in a foreign land. They live amongst foreign people. We find in verse 2 it says, The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Mandalon and Chilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem in Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there. Now there's irony even here. Bethlehem, you want to know what Bethlehem means? House of bread. It's ironic that the house of bread had no bread. They had to flee that which is called the house of bread because there was no bread. And Ephrathites, this means nothing to us in the moment, but it will mean everything. First Samuel here. I want you to hear this verse, and it's on the screen. You can read it if you want. Now, David was the son of an Ephrathite of Bethlehem in Judah named Jesse, who had eight sons in the days of Saul. The man was already old and advanced in years. Little clues are going to be scattered by our author here, Ruth, of what is coming. Letting us in that this is part of a bigger story. Ruth is a love story, but it's part of a much bigger story. Friends, just a, a little side application, a side note. As you read the Bible, it's not 66 books that have their own story. It's one big book with 66 parts telling one grand story of redemption. The story of Ruth is part of that story of redemption. It's building to the climax, which comes through the son of David, Ephraimite. Just keep that in mind as you read and study the Bible. It all fits together. But here, this one family, as they sojourn, as they flee from their homeland to sojourn, tragedy strikes. Ruth 1, 3. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. A family in which sorrows are now beginning to build up. They've already endured famine, had to flee their homeland and, and seek to sojourn. And now, now a wife and two sons lose a husband and a dad. The sorrows begin to stack up, one tragedy after another. Now, we must be careful here with Elimelech that the temptation here is for us to say, 
All right, Elimelech, you sojourned in a foreign land. You died because of sin. Friends, that's not the main point here of Ruth, and therefore we should be careful. Elimelech, very well, God may have struck him because of it. That we don't have a prohibition at this time in God's word to not go and find refuge. That will later come. Israel is later in, in the prophets told, do not go and find refuge in these foreign lands. But in this moment, there's not a strict forbidding here. So we need to be careful to read this in on Elimelech because the main point is Naomi and the sorrows that are stacking up upon her. And it's God bitterly dealing with it. And that's where we want to keep our focus this morning. Not on Elimelech, and is this tied to sin here? But that sorrows are stacking up. But look what sorrow leads to. Verse 4. These took Moabite wives. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other Ruth. They lived there about 10 years. This is the longest stretch of time in the book of Ruth in chapter 1. 10 years here or so are covered in this whole chapter from the time they flee to the time they only returns. Everything else speeds up. But here, 10 years, these two sons, Mahalon and Chilion, take two foreign wives. And what happens? Sorrow again strikes. Verse 5. And both Mahalon and Chilion died, so that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. Here we can speak, because God's word and law clearly does call out against the people of Israel intermarrying with those of different nations. Now, let me clarify here. Brothers and sisters, if you're applying this of different nations today, you miss the point. It's not about interracial marriage. It's not about intercultural marriage. It's about faith marriage. Like-minded believers is Marrying like-minded believers. Israel, who held to Yahweh, married other odd-fearing, Yahweh-believing people. That's the main point here. Keep that in mind. But here, they've gone and married people who believe in other gods. Here's what the Lord says, though, regarding this matter. I thought I had this verse. I don't. Anyways, Deuteronomy 7, 3-4, it says... You shall not intermarry with them, giving your daughters to their sons, or taking their daughters for your sons. For they would turn away your sons from following you to serve other gods. Then the anger of the Lord would be kindled against you, and he would destroy you quickly. Here from Anon and Chilean, we can say they were in sin, and part of their death has to do with sin. And yet, in the midst of it, God is at work. But we see, again, a third sorrow added, the sorrow stacking up for Naomi. She's lost her homeland and having to sojourn in a foreign land. She's lost her husband, and now she's lost her two sons to death. The sorrows are stacking up upon her. She is feeling the weight of them. Friends, we live in a day of sorrows. We live in a world full of sorrow because like Naomi, we live east we live east of the promised land. We live east of the land in which all was created as good. Part of living in a fallen and sin-filled world is that we live in a world where sorrows reign supreme. We're going to face trials. We're going to face sorrow because of the sin of our first parents, Adam and Eve. When they took of the forbidden fruit of the forbidden tree in the Garden of Eden, they were kicked out. And when they were kicked out, sin and death entered into the world. And that is the world in which we live now. Friends, many of you feel this. You feel the fact of sorrow upon sorrow. You have faced and seen loved ones having died in the last year or so. Some of you in this congregation are facing sorrow upon sorrow of sickness and serious illnesses. Others are facing sorrows that cannot even touch today. But you're dealing with real sorrow. This is part of living in a fallen and broken world. And Christian, it's okay for us 
to lead for it. Just as Naomi begins to do. And that's where we turn in our second point. We live in sorrow in the midst of it. Uh, but we can trust God in the midst of it. Um, before I actually move to point two, sorry, I got ahead of myself again. So many things here in Ruth stand out. It's easy to do this. But I want to go back to, to this reality and application of look at where this family went to dwell. They went to dwell in a foreign land, thinking that this was where they could find refuge. And what happened? Death came. They were struck by death. I want to read a quote here from Corey Tendon. There are no ifs in God's world, and no places that are safer than other places. The center of his will is our only safety. Let us pray that we may always know it. There are no ifs in God's world, and no places that are safer than other places. The center of his will is our only safety. Let us pray that we may always know it. Friends, while we look to other lands thinking they promise refuge and comfort and safety, the grass appears greener. It's not always that. The safest place isn't what looks most appealing as Naomi and her family find out. That place of refuge ended up being a place of death. Friends, let us beware of thinking that something else will provide a refuge and seek. The only safe place is that of God himself, of his perfect will, resting in him and his soul. Let us remember that even as we now turn to our second point and move forward. See, I did that. Bitter weeping. Verse 6 and 7. Then she arose with her daughters in law to return from the country of Moab. For she had heard in the fields of Moab that the Lord had visited his people and given them food. So she set out from the place where she was with her two daughters in law, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. In the midst of their sorrow, they hear God has provided. He has provided bread once more in Bethlehem, in the land of Judah. They heard this in the fields of Moab, so they began to journey back. Ruth, or Naomi and her two daughters-in-law, Orpah and Ruth, set out. But then reality strikes. Their grief hits them, and the consequences of it. You know, for many of us in those moments of grief, it doesn't fully hit until you get in the car and pick up the phone to dial a beloved grandmother, because that's what you did. And you realize she's not there. It's then that the grief hits, and, and for Naomi, as she's journeying back, the reality sets in. She's got these two daughter-in-laws, and she has nothing for them. Verse 8. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each of you to her mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you, as you have dealt with the dead, and with me. This is the kindest thing Naomi thinks she can do for her two daughters-in-law, to send them back, to send them back to their own homes, to their mother's house, so that the Lord may deal kindly with them. But here's where the, the author begins to show us why she's urging them to turn back in these days, it would have not been called mother's house. It would have been normally father's house because the father, the husband, would have been the provider. He would have cared for his family. That was the only way of protection and refuge for the family was the husband, the father, to provide in these ways. And yet, Naomi says mother's house because she realizes the poverty and the danger of these two widows. They've lost their means of provision, their husbands. They're vulnerable to society, susceptible to everything. A famine even extending worse, because now even if the Lord provides rain, who is going to gather in the harvest for them? So she sends them back to their mother's house and thinking she's doing them kindness. This begins to unfold here in verses 9 and following. 
The Lord grant that you may find rest, each of you, in the house of her husband. And she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. And they said to her, No, we will return with you to your people. Then Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb that they may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, even if I should have a husband this night and should bear sons, why would you therefore wait till they were grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for it is exceedingly bitter to me for your sake that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. We see this unfolding of Naomi's concern for them, this feeling of utter hopelessness for them. She says, like, why are you going to go with me? I don't have sons in my womb, even if I got pregnant this night. Are you going to wait? Are you going to wait 13 years until they're able to be uh, able to be given to you? Keep in mind that that would have been about the norm of the day. 13, not 18, not 20, not 30. But even just waiting 13 years would have been too long. How would have they been cared for in those 13 years waiting until that day they could be given? She weeps in her sorrow. She thinks God has dealt bitterly with her here. This is exactly what sorrows can do. It's not wrong for us to feel the weight of sorrow. We should weep as they only wept. We should weep as her daughter-in-laws wept. But we must be mindful of what's going on in our heart. And those sorrows lead us to bitterness, lead us to forgetfulness. I love what John Piper here writes. He says, when we have decided that God is against us, we usually exaggerate our hopelessness. When we have decided that God is against us, we usually exaggerate our hopelessness. And when we exaggerate our hopelessness, our hearts become bitter to God. Because we feel utterly hopeless even when that's not the truth, when that's not reality. We begin as Naomi here. She acknowledges, yes, her daughters-in-law do not have sons of her own, but she forgets a reality that God's law provides for those who have lost a spouse. It provides a family redeemer, a family kinsman to redeem them. Things that we'll see Ruth unfold as time goes, Ruth or Naomi forgets in this moment because of her bitterness. Friends, let us weep. Let us feel sorrow. It is right to grieve. It is right for us to feel that sense of sorrow and loss. But it is not good for our hearts to become hopeless, to forget the truths of the gospel, the hope that we have in Jesus of new life, those promises he has promised to us, those provisions along the way. Instead, let us remember let us not forget and let us who are seeing brothers and sisters suffer come alongside them and remind them of these truths. That's the best way we counsel and minister to others is to remind of those truths. Because Naomi here in the moment forgets. Again, look down at verse 13. Would you therefore wait till they were grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughter's spirit is exceedingly bitter to me for your sake that the Lord, the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. She feels the hand of the Lord has gone out against her. She misses what's going on. As she urges them to go back, they continue to grieve. Verse 14. Then they lifted up their voices and wept again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. One daughter-in-law turns back, and one clings. In the midst of her bitter weeping and missing the point, God is beginning to show her, I have given you something. I have not left you alone. I have not forsaken you. I have given you a daughter-in-law who loves you. Verse 15. Through 17. And she said, See, your sister in law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister in law. 
But Ruth said, Do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go, and where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts me from you. In the midst of her bitterness, Naomi misses this. She has not been abandoned. God gives her his mercy and grace through the means of his servant, Ruth. Someone who turned from her foreign gods and declared, Yahweh is my God. Your God shall be my God. Your people, my people. I am identifying with you and your people. Ruth clings to her mother-in-law in in love. She begins to show the steadfast love of the Lord to Naomi in the way she clings to her. Ruth is putting on full display of God's covenant and faithful love to his people. Ruth is the picture of this. She clings so tightly to her mother-in-law. Notice what it goes on here to say in verse 18. And when Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more. It's not just that Ruth said, I will stay with you, Naomi, and kind of like, what did I get myself into? You know, this, is this really lies? No. She sets her determination here to choose to stay loyal to Naomi, to choose Naomi's people and Naomi's God as her own friends. Let me tell you something. If this does not describe the picture of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, you have missed what faith is. Determined, not movable. This is the picture that Ruth's faith is painting, her determination to go this way. That she is determined to go, that Naomi doesn't even feel she can push back. Brothers and sisters, our faith in Jesus is to be this person. It's to be firm where it is not movable by the world, not movable by the afflictions that come into our life, not because of the strength of faith itself, but the object of that faith, Christ, the solid rock on which we stand. This is the faith we are to have. Friend, this is the faith you are being invited into this morning as we study this book of Ruth. See true faith, faith that rests in Jesus Rest in a promise at faith like Ruth. It's worthy of being imitated. But as we continue here to see, we need to see the sorrows have stacked up for Naomi. She is bitterly weeping. She's blind to this reality. Here Ruth makes this bold declaration that Naomi is still bitterly struggling. Look at verse 19. So the two of them went on until they came to Bethlehem. And when they came to Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the woman said, Is this Naomi? She said to them, Do not call me Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went away full, and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? You see how this continued bitterness, this continued blindness is working in Naomi's heart? She misses it. God has not brought her back empty. He's given her a daughter-in-law who's sticking with her regardless of bloodline. He's giving her Ruth who is determined to stick by her side. The only thing to separate is death itself. Naomi misses it. She misses also what she comes back in the midst of. And this is what we turn to in our third and final point this morning. A timely return. Here in the midst of this, they come back to Bethlehem. They come back to the house of bread because bread is now present in the land. The Lord has provided for them and bringing them back. Naomi through the midst of this has gotten something right. In the midst of her bitterness, she has gotten right. God is sovereignly over every one of these events in her life. She's right when she acknowledges there that 
uh, the Lord in th verse 13 has dealt with them. The hand of the Lord has gone out against me. She's right in acknowledging it, that God's sovereign over these events, that he's in control over every one of these circumstances that has happened. She's right in hoping that it will be the hand of the Lord that will go with her daughters-in-law as she sends them back. But she misses why this matters. It's not that God is bitter towards her. Friends, maybe in the midst of your sorrows, you think God is bitter. Maybe you think he's unjust and unloving and unkind because he allows suffering to come. This is a reminder again, we live in the kingdom. We live in a fallen world, and yet God is working in the midst of these evils, in the midst of these sorrows for our ultimate good, and he is walking right there with us. Notice back up in verses 6 and 7. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law to return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the fields of Moab that the Lord had visited his people and given them food. So she set out from the place where she was with her two daughters-in-law, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. They just have, you just happen to hear and miss God's kindness to you? God allowed you to hear in the midst of it that there was provision for you to bring you and cause you and your daughters and all to head back towards the house of bread, back to Bethlehem, where God's provisions were about to be poured upon its people. Not only that, notice where she returns. Verse 22. Now Naomi had a relative, or sorry, now, so Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, with her, who returned from the country of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem. Does it stop there? No. At the beginning of barley harvest. Ruth here shows us God's sovereign hand is at work to provide and care for his people. He, in the midst, when we are tempted to say God has dealt bitterly with us, God's hand is not removed from us. He's caring for us. He's there with us. He's providing for us. He's working in us. We will live out sorrow in the midst of these lies. But in the midst of those sorrows, we need to remember God is a God who is near. John Piper, in his short commentary on Ruth, has couple quotes here that I want us to read. <clears throat> we will see from the story of Ruth and from the cross of Christ that it, this life, our hope in the next depends on God's reign over all things. It may be hard to embrace when the pain is great, but far worse would be the weakness of God and his inability to stop the blowing of a wind and the flight of a bullet. And he goes on to add, the book of Ruth reveals the hidden hand of God in the bitter experience of his people. Brothers and sisters, let us see the goodness of the sovereignty of God, what is known as his providence. Providence simply means the goodness of his sovereignty. That's the best way I can quickly and easily sum that up. Providence is, is the goodness of God's sovereignty in his provision for his people. This is what God does for me. He does for his people Israel time and time again. He takes them through sorrow so that they may draw near to him and see his good hand. They just need to rest in him and him alone. Friends, whatever sorrow you're going through this morning, see that God is not abandoning you. He is inviting you to draw near to him, to see his good hand and how he provides and cares for you. The question is, will we trust in his hand, or will we seek a false refuge elsewhere? Friends, let us turn to God and trust him in his goodness, because that is the best refuge there is. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your word this morning. Father, we pray, Lord, that we would hope in you and trust in you. Or that our hope in life and death would be in Christ and Christ alone. That in the midst of joy and sorrow, we would remain trusting. Father, help us in this. 
Or even as we now prepare to come and take of the Lord's Supper, Lord, we pray, O oh Lord, that you would help our hearts to trust. Lord, help us to be reminded of what Christ has done for us on the cross, that one timely has come and shed his blood for us while we were still sinners. At the right time, Christ died for us. God, we pray, Lord, that this would strengthen our hope and our hearts this morning. God, help us to take and to remember your love and your kindness for us in Jesus. We ask and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm-hmm.